People are going to guess I'm going to say yes to that, but I'll, I'll say a bit of uh, background before I get to the punchline. Now, clearly, the last crisis wasn't anticipated by the mainstream in economic theory. And I, I find that if you, if you read the literature of academic economics and central banks leading up to the crisis, they're actually triumphalists. They've finally tamed the trade cycle. So this is Bernanke making quite that point, talking at a panel in 2004, saying that there's been this moderation in cycles and volatility called the Great Moderation, and he said the sources are controversial, but he's willing to take credit for it. And uh, saying, in fact, it was a welcome change in the economy. And in the OECD in June of 2007, and those who work in the financial markets, I assume, agree with me, you date the crisis from August 2007 when BNP shut down three of its funds on August 9th. This is two months before the crisis began. Their attitude was the situation was better than they've experienced in years. Their central forecast was quite benign. A soft landing in the United States. Can you imagine a hard landing? Uh, sustained recovery in Europe. Strong job creation and falling unemployment. That's the vision they had. <coughs> and that then what actually happened was the cycles that Bernanke was seeing where unemployment and inflation were declining over time, suddenly bang the crisis hits and unemployment goes through the roof and inflation turns suddenly into deflation. The fall from plus five to minus two percent rate of change in prices in America. So quite a substantial turnaround. Now that's what they experienced. And after the event, they think, well, those are two separate events. The Great Moderation was one thing which we helped cause, which is wonderful, and the financial crisis came along, which some naughty exogenous shock caused, which we can't identify. Um, so Bernanke, writing in 2010, was saying, what's the implication of this crisis for economic theory? And he's fundamentally an academic economist. And he admits that standard models that like the New Keynesian one didn't, it's called New Keynesian. It's, it is new, but it's not Keynesian, okay? It's New Samuelsonian didn't predict the crisis and didn't include the, the facts of financial instability. So does that mean that, that, that it's uh, effectively flawed or irrelevant? And he said the answers are qualified no. And I, I simply love how self-serving this is. Economic models are only useful for the context in which they are designed. So they're not universal, despite what he taught you in the last week's lecture. Most of the time, serious financial instability is not an issue. Standard models were designed for that sort of time. So it's like a road map that works when there's a road, and if you go off-road, there's nothing to help you whatsoever. And yet we're living in an off-road world. So he said, they're part of the intellectual framework, these models that he's now defending, even after they failed to see the crisis coming, defending on the basis that actually helped cause the stability of the previous two decades or three decades. Now, it's, to me, it's self-serving bollocks, but that's typical in academic economics. So I want to take another look at that data and include something that Bernanke left out and all conventional theory does as well. And that's graphed on the right-hand side. That's the ratio of private debt to GDP, the black line. Now, that was doing something quite dramatic, going from, in America's case, 120% of GDP in 1997 up to 270% by the absolute peak after the crisis began. A dramatic increase in debt. Now, they don't think it matters at all. They don't think there's no, any way to include what the financial sector generates, which is fundamentally debt, into macro models. So what I've done here is I've taken that same inflation and unemployment data and I've graphed it over time and the colour change is something I'll, I'll explain what it is in a moment, but the, this, this is the beginning back in the 1980s. You have the boost out to stagflation and these period of cycles that then seem to be converging towards a nice equilibrium point of about 5% unemployment and 3% inflation, which they, or 2% inflation, which they think is absolutely hunky-dory, and then bang, this blasts out sideways, completely inexplicable. Now, this is a model that I've built of Hyman Minsky's financial instability hypothesis. You'll notice it's got the same basic pattern. Seems to be heading towards equilibrium and then bang, without, apparently without warning, it blasts out there. But in fact, it's not without warning because there's a third dimension to my model and a third dimension to the data that the Federal Reserve leaves out, and that's the ratio of private debt to GDP. And then if you include them, I think you can see my model is getting the stylized facts of that period fairly accurately. Diminishing cycles in employment and inflation with rising private debt followed by a crisis. And that's precisely what this model generates. And that's Minsky's financial instability hypothesis. Now, People who haven't been lobotomised by a degree in economics, if you know, if you've seen a Digital Cactivori's article on that front, that an economics degree is a 9,000 pound lobotomy, uh, if you haven't been brainwashed by that, of course you'd expect economists to include 
money in the model of the economy, but they include neither money nor banks nor debt. And here is again Ben Anke explaining why they don't. They're talking about the idea of debt deflation. He said, Fisher's idea of debt deflation as an explanation for why the Great Depression occurred was less influential in academic circles because of the counter-argument to Fisher's proposition that debt deflation, and read this carefully, represented no more than a redistribution from one group, debtors, to another group, creditors. Now that's implying that when they go bankrupt, debtors pay their debts, which is pretty cool to begin with. But that's not the main thing I'm focusing upon here, because he said the only way you can get a macroeconomic impact out of debt would to have implausibly large differences in how the in spending uh, behaviour of the borrowers and the lenders. Now, the essence of this is what's called the loanable funds model of, of banking, and I've realised over the last decade just how important that is to maintaining the way the mainstream thinks about macroeconomics. And the basic idea, and this is now a proposition from um, Paul Krugman, saying, think of it this way, when debt is rising, it's not the economy as a whole borrowing more money. So he sees no relationship between rising debt and a rising amount of money. He said, instead, it's less patient people borrowing for more patient people. A typical school, child's, child's, childish way that economists think about the behaviour of banking. Now, the Bank of England did a brilliant job. I don't know how many of you have seen this paper, but the Bank of England, in the beginning of last year in the quarterly review, I think it was, published a beautiful article called Money Creation in the Modern Economy. It might as well have been a direct letter to Krugman and Bernanke and so on, saying, for God's sake, tanks take banks seriously. They create money. You've left it out of your thinking. So this idea that loans create money and create new demand is something that's now, the Bank of England is aware of that. It's academic economics that's dragging the chain. And the logic of the mainstream model as to why they leave it out is they think lending is just between a person who saves and a person who spends. That's the whole idea. Banks are just intermediaries in the process. So if you model what they see going on and you think about expenditure by three different people, then patient, patient and the shop, and this is the expenditure coming out of one of the, uh, the impatient agent and this is where the impatient agent spends, the impatient agent's borrowed B from the patient agent. Now that means the impatient agent has got B that they can spend at the shop, whereas in this case I'm showing uh, the patient agent spending less on A and less on the shop as well. And overall this plus B here is cancelled out by that minus B. Now if you add up the column, the, the, the diagonals there, that's aggregate demand, as economists define it. And that's the loan. You have an increase in spending power for the impatient agent but that's offset by the decreased spending power of the patient agent, the two cancel out. Well, that's the way they think. The real world, of course, is that it's not a patient agent lending to an impatient agent, it's a bank lending to someone in the economy. And in that case, the bank's asset rises by the level of the loan and the, their liabilities rise by the level of the loan as well. So you have an increase in spending power for B, but there's no offsetting fall in demand. So the process of lending creates new money and it also creates new demand and new income when that borrowed money is spent into the economy. So my way of paraphrasing all this is to say that demand and income are demand and income things turn over of existing money plus demand and income from new debt. And leaving out that plus is leaving out about 20% of demand during the peak of the bubble and about minus 5% of the demand during the peak, of the peak of the slump. So you have rising debt, you have rise, increasing demand and income and asset prices, and falling debt reduces them. So that's the, why it's so important and so simply, obviously important to include banking sector, loans and debt and money in the dynamics of the economy. And you'll then find that the change in debt and the acceleration in debt explain all the factors that the mainstream can't understand. That includes the boom before the crash, crash itself and the ups and downs of asset markets. And also, and this is why I'm talking about a future crash, the certainty that the world has turned Japanese. You know the Vapors song, Turning Japanese? We've followed Japan with an 18 year lag into the biggest private debt bubble in human history. And we're now caught in the aftermath of that as Japan has been for the last 25 years. So if you look at Japan's private debt crisis, I'm now graphing the historical data the top big one is Japan, which peaked at a private debt ratio of 225% of GDP about five years after its crisis began. Then you have America over here, which is the blue line, 
peaking at about 170% about two years after its crisis. This is Britain, which peaked at about 200% of GDP, again about two years after its crisis. Here's China, I'll talk about that in a moment. So there's Japan, well and truly the outlier. It's the very first one to do it. Now what then happened from that point on is that the demand that should come from changing levels of debt, there, there should be demand in a well-functioning capitalist economy, part of the demand should come from rising debt. Okay? It's a sensible part of where demand comes from in the economy. But since it's not there, you suddenly, and because it's so volatile, you have the ups and downs in unemployment in, in Japan. Now, I have graphed this data multiple times for America. I only recently graphed it for Japan because I'm doing this stuff on my own effectively. I've had time, a long time to get around what I'm, all the issues I'm trying to cover. This is looking at the change in private debt in Japan and correlating it with the unemployment rate. The correlation coefficient there is minus 0.91. And that's over from 1965 until 2015. That's half a century of data. And I'll often get some smart ass in the audience saying correlation isn't causation. I have a causal argument, and if you think you have to, you can use that semi-cliche to get out of talking about the, this correlation, you're just not taking the data seriously. Notice the crisis began when the rate of change of that debt slowed down. Now look at America. America fell into exactly the same trap, and it's been in that trap since the 1990s. That's the American data on change in debt, which is the red line graphed on the left-hand side here, and the unemployment rate on the right-hand in blue. And the correlation coefficient there again, minus 0.93. That's over 25 years of data. Now, what can we face in the future? Well, we've ignored Japan. We've, we've blamed all the wrong factors in Japan so far. When you consider the correct factor, which is the role of private debt, and look at where Japan got to and where we are now and, and bring Japan's crisis forward 18 years to make it coincide with the West, what does Japan tell us we're likely to face? This would be the best case scenario, by the way. And you can see Japan reached a peak of debt much the same time as, uh, in that case, Spain after its bubble. And then it declined for a while and it's been bouncing around at about the level we now find most of the Western economies are bouncing around at, about 175% of GDP. And at that level, you're not going to get much credit growth. It's going to run out and fall back down again. And you're going to have the ups and downs that Japanese have been through for the last, they say, the last decade. It's the last quarter century now. Now, why is it so severe this time round? Why is this so different to any crisis anybody in this room has experienced? And that's because we're in the biggest debt bubble in the history of capitalism. It isn't just a little flip. It's the biggest we've ever seen. I have, I've taken data here from the American Federal Reserve and run it backwards through data of the census to make overlapping data series uh, tack onto each other as you have to do with historical data. But this is my best case plot. The red line is the level of private debt in America back to 1834 as a percentage of GDP. The blue line is government debt. I think you can see the trend. You can also see the peak back in the Great Depression. And having done this historical adjustment, we've reached a higher peak We've now levelled out at a higher level of debt to GDP using comparable data than occurred at the peak of the Great Depression, even with the deflation that occurred at the time. Non, and that, the leading non-orthodox economist to establish what's called the stock flow consistent modelling approach, Wynne Godley, uh, he began warning of the crisis using balance sheet analysis back in 1998. I began warning it in 2006. It's still ignored by the mainstream. We still can't get them to take this seriously. Now, what do you then, when you drill down and say, that's like looking at the aggregate data, what about individual markets like, for example, the stock market? This is the correlation of the acceleration of margin debt to the level of the S&P 500 since 1990. And that correlation, I think, is about, what is it, 0.53. You're working with the, the rate of change of the rate of change of margin debt and the rate of change of the S&P, two very volatile systems, still finding that level of, of correlation, which again I'm saying is a largely causal factor. Housing even more so. This is the correlation of change in mortgage, acceleration in mortgage debt and change in the house price index in America. That comes out of 0.77. Again, you can see the obvious role that debt has in the economy, which you cannot get a mainstream economist to consider. So the person who did understand it was Minsky, and that's the person whose work I've spent the last 28 years developing. And Minsky wrote this overall perspective on capitalism, I think is the most important 
intellectual framework you can have for understanding where we are, is that capitalism is inherently flawed, being prone to booms, crises and depressions, is that this instability is due to characteristics the financial system must possess. It's not, it's not an optional extra you can refine away, if it is to be consistent with full-blown capitalism. It's that such a financial system will be capable of both generating signals that induce an accelerating desire to invest and of financing that accelerating investment. And he called the model the financial instability hypothesis and the combination of cycles and debt and non-equilibrium behaviour were at the absolute centre of the model. Now cycles, debt and non-equilibrium are three words you won't find in mainstream textbooks. So his starting point, and this is again a, a very cogent definition of where his perspective began from, is that the natural starting point for analysing the relation between debt and income that is, he sees a relationship between debt and income. Even a lot of non-mainstream economists still can't quite comprehend this one. A relationship between debt and income is to take an economy with a cyclical past, so it has to be cyclical, which is now doing well. The inherited debt structure reflects the history of the economy, which includes a period when the economy did not do well. So there's a previous crisis. So at that point, accepted liabilities are based on a margin for error on both sides of the balancing balance, uh, the, the building balance sheet. But over a period the economy does well lengthens, two things become evident in boardrooms. Existing debts are easily validated and units that are heavily in debt prospered. It paid to lever. So you get a change in expectations coming out of this period of tranquility. He said after the event margins of safety were too high. So as a result of a, over a period where the economy does well, views about the acceptable level of leverage from both bankers and businessmen rise. And given that increase, you then get a bubble economy coming out of it. The economy is transformed into a burn economy. So stability is destabilising, as Minsky once put it. So a period of tranquil growth becomes a period of speculative excess. You get euphoric expectations. Everybody on the stock market starts buying cocaine and doing their bids that way, and you're off into the crazy world of the bubble economy. So you see stable growth is inconsistent with how finance is provided in the capitalist economy. And this is one of the strongest insights I think I've ever read in economics to say it follows that the fundamental instability of a capitalist economy is upward. A lot of critics of capitalism will come out and talk about a tendency towards stagnation. You even get Larry Summers talking about secular stagnation now, seeing a tendency for depressed behaviour. What Minsky saw is a tendency to have a euphoric behaviour which you finance with debt which then causes a crisis later. So the tendency to transform doing well into a speculative investment boom is the basic instability in a capitalist economy. Now it's fundamentally a non-equilibrium model, so I'll take you through the basic steps in it. You start with an economy historical time. Those are two things which are left out of conventional economic thinking, history and time. Since you're in history, there's a previous crisis. Let's call it uh, 2000 or 2007. Let's go, for two, let's go for 1990, actually. It was the last really big bust. Given that crisis, firms and banks are both conservative about the level of debt they'll get into, so only conservative projects get funded. But because the economy is recovered, most of those projects succeed, and firms and banks then revise their risk premiums, giving you a higher acceptable level of debt to equity, valuing assets more highly, and you just start getting self-fulfilling expectations out of that. With a decline in risk aversion, there's more investment. With more investment, the economy grows faster, asset prices rise, so any nutcase can make money on the stock market. Uh, there's an increased willingness to lend money and that actually boosts demand, as I've shown uh, earlier. You enable riskier investments, so more things are actually being financed which will lose money. And asset speculation is rising as well. And you eventually got what Minsky called the euphoric economy, which I think is a brilliant phrase that the, the financial press used to, used to use to describe expectations in 87 or 2000, long before they'd read Minsky. And out of this comes what he called Ponzi financiers, who are financiers that have a cash flow from their investments that's always less than their debt servicing costs. So they profit by selling assets on a rising market, but they are fundamentally bankrupt. When you look at the cash flow from their businesses, it's less than their debt servicing costs. They're placed fundamentally insolvent. So they've got a desperate demand for money, and they'll pay virtually anything to get money to roll over their debts before they can sell an asset. So you, initially they can do that because there's the capability to sell into a rising asset market and the huge supply of money out there and they're obviously willing borrowers. You also get a change in income distribution and this is crucial because as the economy goes into a boom, wages will start to rise, raw material prices will also rise which will start to undercut some of the profit expectations that were built into the projections for investment returns and you will get a breakdown not because of some external shock 
not just because the Fed Reserve puts up the interest rates to try to control the bubble, but because of the internal dynamics of the system. So that changing cost structure undermines profit expectations. The Ponzi's are necessarily losing money. If they can't get a loan rolled over, they can fail out of the blue. My favourite ever was an Australian Ponzi, because I know him too well having come from there, called Christopher Scase, who made a $3 billion takeover for MGM bid. It was Kikorian sensibly took the board to turn it down, and a week after making that $3 billion takeover, he went bankrupt because he couldn't make a $12 million loan instalment. If he'd got the money to finance the MGM takeover, he would have kept on going. So they're accumulating debts and their shares are widespread. One of my good friends has three Quintex shares, which are Christopher Scase's shares, uh, heading towards the, to the, the toilet in her bathroom. The sudden crash, because they can't roll over their debts in time. A lot of these investments, which are euphoric, will fail as well. Rising rates can make conservative projects go under at the same time, and they can sell into markets trying to cover their financial situation. So all sorts of triggers can end the, the bubble in asset markets in particular. And as soon as that rising trend falters, then the whole thing unwinds. The Ponzi's go bankrupt almost instantly because they can't sell assets for a profit anymore, and they can't get debt to roll over the debts they do have. Asset prices collapse and debt to equity ratios rise initially. That expansion of the money supply goes into reverse, so demand also falls backwards. Investment evaporates, growth slows down, and you're back where we are now where we were in 2007, another debt-induced recession. So that's the basic cycle. What happens next depends upon the inflation rate. If you have high inflation at the time, or you have a large government sector, they can both attenuate the problem. High inflation will mean debts are repaid not because of real growth, but because you have a green increase in cash flows. And you'll have a, but the economy will remain depressed for low investment, so you have stagflation which is Minsky's genuinely Keynesian explanation for the stagflationary period in the 70s and 80s. And you'll get back to a cycle again after that, as we did. Low inflation, on the other hand, you can't repay the debts, and you'll have a chain reaction of bankruptcy, which leads you to a Great Depression. That's what we had back in 1929, and that's what we're going through now. Big government, on the other hand, necessarily, unless you have the EU in control, has anti-cyclical spending and taxation. And that gives businesses a cash flow to repay debt they couldn't otherwise repay during the downturn and lets them delever without it depressing demand too much as well. So that's the basic logic. Now, that's verbal. My whole role in the last 20 years has been turning into a mathematical model. And believe it or not, that's the model there, but it's probably better if I run it for you dynamically. So I'll just get it ticking over here. And what's going on, it's actually quite simple. It looks complicated, but I have capital here producing output determines how many workers you hire, gives you an employment rate, which determines wages, which then gives you a wage bill, which you subtract from output to get profits. Uh, that leads to the level of the rate of profit and investment down here. Investment then adds to the capital stock and off you go. But I'm including debt in the situation, so the amount of money you borrow gives you an interest charge, which is also subtracted from profit. Now, when, you, when this model starts, I want you to look at this graph here, which I've got the wages being graphed against the employment rate. And that's the type of indicator that a conventional economists were looking at. They didn't worry about debt. They did worry about inflation. They didn't care about workers getting less income. They did care about getting a stabilised employment rate. But this one here summarises the two factors they worried most about. Uh, wages, uh, sorry, uh, the wage share, which is a proxy for inflation. I've got inflation there as well. So I'll run the model. And what you get is a series of cycles which appear to be converging towards an equilibrium. They're ignoring this rising level of debt. They're seeing employment cycles getting smaller, thinking it's all going very well. And inflation is also diminishing. Carried on a bit further, and rather than settling down to an equilibrium point here, suddenly you blast off down this way. And what's happening there is this rising level of debt, which you're now seeing going exponential over here, is more than compensating for workers losing wage share. And profit, which has been nice and stable, notice profit looked like it heading towards an equilibrium here. Without warning, the profit rates collapses and goes negative. And the debt takes over the economy. You've gone down the black hole of debt. I haven't got bankruptcy built in here, and I've turned the government sector off on that model as well. But that's the basic dynamics that I get out of my model. It's what we saw in the financial crisis. Now, I know it's complicated. 
or complex, but it's actually a simple set of rules. And what scares me about this model now is I realise just how simple those rules are, because I can actually boil it down to three simply irrefutable statements. In fact, the model's based not on a set of equations, but a set of identities. And the first one says the employment rate will rise if economic growth exceeds the sum of population growth and growth in labour productivity. Now, that's true. That's simply a fact. The second one said the wages share of output will rise if money wage demands exceed the sum of inflation and growth in labour productivity. That's also a fact. Now, you can have those two facts and still live in a neoclassical world, though it's cyclical. The third fact you can't have, and that's the simple one, the private debt to GDP ratio will rise if the rate of growth of debt exceeds the rate of economic growth. That's also a fact. Now, you, wouldn't, you cannot know how that's going to behave just by looking at the facts. The facts, those facts alone won't explain what's going on. Um, it's not sensible to disagree with them, but you can't understand them without simulating and seeing what happens in a complex system. And what I see there is this idea of rising debt leading to a crisis through a series of cycles, culminating actually finally in a debt deflation. And that's where we are now. The one thing stopping it is government deficits, but governments are still beholden to the conventional way of thinking and they're trying to eliminate their deficits. And by eliminating their deficits, they perpetuate the private debt problem. So what we're going to see now, and what the period we're now in, is this period of very, very suppressed demand from credit. So we're graphing here the USA, UK, Japan and China from 1980 forward. And notice after the, uh, whoops, hang on, pardon me, after the crisis began, a dramatic fall in the rate of change of private debt, even though it's starting to increase again in all the countries I'm showing except the UK on current data, it's increasing at a much more anemic rate than it was before the crisis. Now, I don't believe it should increase at that rate. It leads to crises. But the only place that's kept us going in terms of credit growth is China. And China's level of credit growth exceeds the greatest level achieved in Japan back in its bubble economy, which is why I think we're in for a huge crash in China at some point very, 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 very soon. So with excessive private debt, you're not going to get much credit growth. And because of that lack of credit demand coming in, that's why economic growth is going to be low. A, a, a normal part of demand for the capitalist economy is not there. So you, you can't have an acceleration in private debt to, to cause an, a sustained increase in the rate of change of GDP anymore. And you're likely to continue getting low and correlated asset returns, except where QE drives up asset prices, which has been a huge factor in the last six years, and also in super cities like London, where the elite incomes and also private debt levels drive up house prices apparently forever. But I think the China crash is inevitable in the next one or two years, and the more the Chinese try to prevent it by pumping up the crisis, the bigger it's going to get to be. Uh, they've only avoided the crisis since 2009 by an enormous increase in private debt, as I said, far faster than Japan did. And it's now well and truly into two danger zones that an author, a co colleague of mine that I highly recommend buying his book, Richard Vague, has a book called The, ne the Next Economic uh, Disaster, I think, and How to Avoid It, An Economic Crisis and How to Avoid It. And doing an empirical study over one and a half centuries, he said every financial crisis had two major indicators before they happened. The first was that private debt reached 1.5 times GDP, or well, China's, even on lag data, and we all know that we can't trust Chinese data, but even the stuff they publish at the BIS gives them a debt ratio of 1.8 times GDP at the beginning of this year. And Richard's other signal was that private debt grew by 18% or more of GDP over a five-year period, while well, China's rose by 70% over the last five years. So it's well and truly fulfilled those figures. I know China is different, but it's not so different that it can avoid having a crisis. So I've given a link there to, to Richard's book, The Next Economic Disaster, where it's coming from. So the punchline for you lot, may you invest in interesting times. Thank you.